was going through a part of your book. I didn't get to because we just got it yesterday. Come on, Esquire. So I can't read the whole thing. But um, in the Miracle be- can read very well. Yes. <laughs> but in the very beginning, you talk about how America was able to implement what Adolf Hitler wanted um, for the Jewish people in Germany, which was a cultural um, genocide, genocide of black people. Yes. And so when I read that, I was like pondering. I was like, oh, I never really thought about it in that successful context, right? Because we always talk about how uh, you know Jim Crow inspired um, Hitler. And so I was wondering if you could expound upon that like a little bit more, for particularly sure. in the context of today's time. Absolutely. Can you uh, bear with me while I just ex- kind of yeah. dig into this yeah, question yeah. a bit? For okay. Sure. So I want to just give context uh, because during the era of the mid 19th century, that let's say 18. 18- 50 until uh, up, up until 1900 and then 1900 up to roughly the 1970s you've got white scientific academic philosophers de- developing anthropological and mind science theories about black people to prove black inferiority right. so i'm going to read uh, an example from a book called the passing of the great race this is a quick uh, excerpt this is written by madison grant in 1916 Wow. He says, Negroes have demonstrated throughout recorded time that they are a stationary species and that they do wow. not possess the potentiality of progress or initiative from within. Mm. Progress from self-impulse must not be confounded with mimicry or progress imposed from without by social pressure or by the slaver's lash. Mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults as are themselves of no value to the community. Mm. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or race. A rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak or unfit or in other words, social failures, would solve the whole question in 100 years. I share that with you because that was common anthropological, scientific, academic theory at the time. It was embraced uh, through the eugenics movement. And that was only 100 years ago. That was only 100 years ago. And so Hitler loved this book. He loved these theories. He looked at what America was doing. Theories like this were used to justify the Buck v. Bell ruling of 1927, where the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that compulsory sterilization of the unfit or undesirable did not violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And so because of that ruling, each state was required to erect and enact a state-level eugenics board. Mm. And so they started compulsory sterilizing people that they deemed retarded, uh, defective, undesirable, and unfit. So you've got a a campaign that is launched to get rid of the defective population in America. 15 million Americans is what they uh, assessed at the time needed to be obliterated or gotten rid of. How many okay. did you say? 15 million. Yeah, I, I mean, in general, like if Hitler loves the book, it's probably bad. Right? Yeah, Can I just say one? Uh, so in 1933, when Adolf Hitler becomes the head of the Nazi party, he says, I've investigated and looked at what America is doing right, right. to get rid of people whose progeny would be of no use to the community. Wow. Right? Come on, bring it down. Yeah. And so the executive secretary, the former executive ser- secretary of the American Eugenic Society, Leon Whitney, he embraced Hitler's sterilization program. And you had Andrew Carnegie, um, the Rockefellers, um, Alexander Graham Bell, who were all political and economic donors to this eugenics movement. And That's so they created nuts. the landscape. I wonder if Harlan Crow has his book. <laughs> <laughs> he has his, he has his uh, he got statue shit in his shrine, man. Well, I think, I think what's so powerful about what you're talking about is, like, a lot of times the narrative of slavery is kind of like these were a couple of bad white people that did slavery, and then, you know, now we've learned better, right? What you're talking about is what we describe now as systemic racism, right? Mm-hmm. You're talking about, like, it wasn't just this white this white slave master, Miss Your Candy was over there, and he was bad, and there were also some white people fighting for him. You're talking about these were the white people in power enacting actual laws, this system that still exists today. I yes. say that because when we talk about racism a lot of times, white people will deny the 
existence of systemic racism. And they'll reduce it to like, this one white person is racist, this one white person is not, I'm not racist, so therefore racism doesn't exist. And you're like, like you're telling us, no, this happened in 1690, uh, uh, this happened this year, this happened this year, and these were laws that you specifically wrote out. Yes. Like, we can go and get the history and research it that were enacted specifically to harm black, brown, indigenous, and people that were non-white. Absolutely. And I think, too, you know, the nuance in all of this, because I was having discussion, and often I do, with an indigenous person, and they were saying, well, you know, we share the commonality of being oppressed. And I think one of the nuances that I tease out in my work that I don't hear very often is when these laws begin to be written, for example, in the colony of Virginia and then in Carolina, those are two that I um, raise up, where they begin to emphasize language like complexion or color. And if you were the color of an Indian, then you were exempted from slavery. If you were the color of a Negro or mulatto, then you were automatically made a slave. And so prima, fa prima facie is uh, on its face, right? That's mm -hmm. the evidence. So if I perceive that you are a Negro or a mulatto, you're automatically a prisoner. You're automatically a slave. You're automatically jailed. Mm -hmm. And so we have an immutable characteristic that we will never be able to get rid of, us, get rid of and we shouldn't, but it is seen as negative, hyper-negative, and derogatorily in this country. And so what I am suggesting in my work, and I use the framework by Dr. Bobby Wright, where he said that white people were psychopaths when it comes to black people and that they have no morality when it comes to race, that white people have constructed a culture of sociopaths mm -hmm. and they, are, they have been socialized to be sociopathic and psychopathic towards black people. But get this, what does this mean for us as black Americans who have been dominated by these people yeah. and we've accepted the same cultural systems, the same belief systems, the same value systems? Because if you watch and engage interactions between black people, what you will begin to notice is that we've been trained to be psychopathic and sociopathic with each other. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. 